Well, before I start today's sermon text, let's look at what happens right before that. God creates the earth with all its vegetation, its weather patterns, and human. Ha Adam. Adam. The human settles in the garden known as Eden, and he's given trees to eat from. With the exception of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For as God says, if the human eats it, the human will surely die. Then God creates an animal kingdom to give Ha Adam company. But none of the animals are the perfect companion. So God puts the human into a deep sleep, removes some of his anatomy, creates a woman who would later be known as Eve. And it says that they were naked and unashamed. Then enters the character of the serpent. The serpent, it says, was the most crafty, the most wise, the most brilliant of all the animal kingdom. And the serpent simply asks Eve, Did God say that you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? And Eve responds, We can eat from the trees. But God said, we shall not eat from the tree in the middle of the garden, or we'll die. The serpent responds and says, you'll not certainly die. For God knows that when you eat this, your eyes will be opened, and you will know good and evil. You will be like God. So when the woman saw that the fruit was good, and that it looked good to her eyes, and that the tree was something to be desired after, to make her wise, she took the fruit and she ate it. And she gave some to her husband, who was with her. Then both of their eyes were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. And then begins our sermon text for today. Genesis 3 starting in verse 8. It can be found on pages 2 and 3 of your your, uh, pew Bibles. It says, They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden at that time in the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to Adam. He said to him, Where are you? Adam responds, I heard the voice of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman who you gave to me, she gave me the fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. The Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike at your heels, and you will strike or he will, you will strike at his head, and he will strike at your heels. This is the word of, the God, of God. Let's pray. God, we do indeed love you. God, we ask that your word changes us. God, may your word help us to be more like you. Help us to love better. Help us to care for your creation. Our glory, honor, and praise are yours now and forever. Amen. So let me begin by saying something about our text for today that for some of you could possibly be challenging to hear. I, along with a lot of scholars and other pastors, believe that this story is a myth. But don't get too hung up on the word myth. Myth does not mean untrue. Myth does not equal lie. Myth does not make it any less the word of God. A myth is a literary device that is used to communicate something using imagery and metaphor. 
Just because I think the creation story is myth does not mean that it's untrue. Here's some great quotes that I found on myths. German novelist Thomas Mann once wrote that a myth is a story about the way things never were, but always are. A Native American creation story begins with, now I don't know if it happened this way or not, but I know this story is true. Rabbinic tradition says, the Bible is true, and some of it, some of it happened. The truth of the Bible is not dependent on its historical factuality. Modern science has shown us. So is this myth literally true? I would say no. But is it really true? Absolutely. We in modern culture tend to identify truth with factuality and we devalue metaphorical language. But all that's to say, the literal historical factuality of Genesis 2 and 3 is less important than the message that it's intended to communicate. And I hope that makes sense. Adam and Eve might not be real historical people. We really have no way of knowing. But their story is the story of humanity. It's a story that helps us to better understand the human condition and our relationship with a God who created us out of love and community. So with that, let's look more at the text for today. As the myth goes, this fictional yet true story, God is walking in the garden when the humans are hiding God asks, where are you? And Adam says, we're hiding. We heard you coming, and we're naked. God asks, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I told you not to? And then they both try to pass the buck. The man says, the woman that you gave to me made me eat it. Adam is pointing fingers both at the woman and at God. And the woman says, the snake made me do it. So God responds by saying, as a result of your actions, because of what you've done, the domino effect is, snake, you're going to slide around on your belly and eat dust. And I'm going to put contempt between you and the humans. And the humans, I'm going to put contempt between the two of you too. Humans, you will strike at the head of creation. And snake, you will strike at the heels of the humans. And the traditional understanding of this is that this documents what is known as the fall of humanity. And this is what the second century church father, Irenaeus, among many others throughout history, have called the doctrine of original sin. This is the idea that because Adam sinned first, we all are born into a fallen world. That's to say... Those who adhere to this theory believe that we're guilty for Adam's sin. That we inherit guilt through the bloodline that traces back to two individuals, Adam and Eve. And I, I could go partway there. I believe we do live in a broken world. That none of us are perfect. I mean, we look around and we can tell this is a broken world. But to say that we all share a common ancestor through whom we inherit sin and a sinful nature, I'm not convinced that's how it works. And I showed my hand a bit, and I revealed that I don't think Adam and Eve were probably real historical figures, but metaphors for humanity. And furthermore, the snake, which is traditionally thought of as being Satan, but nowhere in the text does it say that. Nowhere in the Bible does it identify the snake as Satan. But I'd even take a step further and say that the snake is not even the antagonist in this myth, but stands as a metaphor for two things. First, the snake in ancient Near East literature symbolizes wisdom, which is illustrated 
when the text says that the snake is the most clever of all the animals in the animal kingdom. Second, the snake represents the rest of God's creation, both the environment and the animal kingdom. So the snake was not tempting the humans in this story, but represented humans' relationship with knowledge and with the rest of creation. The snake is no more good and no less good, no more evil, no less evil than the humans. He's just another ignorant character in this parable. We'll return to that, but back to the theory of original sin. As this theory goes, God kicks the humans out of the garden because due to God's perfection, God couldn't be near sin. But I have to reject that God couldn't be near sin. Couldn't be near a sinful humanity. God never left humanity. God has been in relationship with creation since the beginning, and no amount of brokenness could separate God from creation. In the story, this is shown when God stitches clothes together for the humans. God remains in relationship. Furthermore, that same God became human in Christ and lived among all the brokenness of the world and continues to live with us now through the Holy Spirit. So you can't tell me that God cut us off from God's presence. God is present. Besides, this is a myth. So there was no literal first sin. There was only an imperfect humanity that makes mistakes from time to time. Sometimes huge mistakes. This was not a literal event, but is only meant to tell us that we, as a collective, Adam and Eve, at times choose to go against what is best for us. And what is this collective sin that we give into? In Genesis 3, the wrong that they committed seems to be a lack of trust in God. The humans see the fruit and agree with the snake. You will not certainly die. They, including the snake, lacked trust that God was really on their side. That God truly was looking out for them. It was simply a doubt that God was actually good, that God actually cared for them and had their best interests in mind. It doesn't seem that God prohibited them from the tree just arbitrarily. In the story, God knew that they weren't ready for the knowledge that it held. And since they didn't trust God, they took matters into their own hands and pursued wisdom through means other than God. They they relied on their own power and grasped at what they wanted. They didn't trust that God would give them the knowledge they needed in the right time. So they went after it on their own, without consulting, without communicating with God. They weren't following the advice that probably all of us have heard from Proverbs 3, 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not rely on your own intelligence. But this metaphor, it's meant to shine on us too. Much of the brokenness in this world is a result of a lack of trust in God's goodness and provision. The sins in our lives show a lack of trust in our lives. And when we look at the Ten Commandments that are found in Exodus... And the first two are about trusting God. It says, you shall have no other God before me. You shall make no idols. And the following commandments are prohibitions to the alternatives to trusting God's goodness. We see, you shall not take the Lord's name in vain. It's saying you don't have to make phony and misleading oaths to get what you want. We read, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. It's saying you can trust that you can take a day off, which your body requires, and you will survive. 
It says, honor your father and mother. There wasn't social security back then. It's saying you can care for your aging elders, some of the most vulnerable people in society, and trust that there will be enough left for you. You should not murder, you should not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you should not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet. It's telling us that you don't have to do these twisted things that hurt other people and yourself to get what you want. You can trust that God is good, that you don't have to result to unethical practices to feel secure. It's not a promise that you're always going to get what you want. But it is a promise that God has placed you in a community, in a creation, among humans, that when it functions correctly, you will be provided for. When you follow these guidelines, you, humans, creation, and God, all will be in right relationship with one another. We see what happens in the story when the humans take a step back from trusting God and they're confronted with this. They start pointing fingers. That woman that you gave me made me do it. So you're both to blame. Or the snake tricked me. It was my circumstances. It was my environment. Sin is not about personal problems and temptation. It's communal. When the first humans stopped trusting God, they became cutthroat. They became selfish. They were worried about their own well-being and comfort. They were willing to throw one another under the bus in order to maintain what they had. When we fail to trust God's goodness, it doesn't merely affect us individually. And that's why people starve. That's why people are oppressed. That's why people are violent to others. That's why the environment is being destroyed. That's why the result of the human sin in Genesis 3 is contempt between humans and the snake, between human and human. That's why we strike the heads of those who are beneath us, and they strike at our heels. It's a metaphor for the privileged kicking those while they're down, but the oppressed both others and creation in general, grasping to attack our ever-vulnerable Achilles tendon. When we trust God, we are generous because we know we are in a community and are contributing to a society that resembles the God who looks out for humanity. This myth was written to an Israelite people who were oppressed in exile and enslaved. So, of course, they had to band together to survive. But this applies to all places, times, people, and circumstances. I mean, what sounds better? The cutthroat world where we're hungry and people remain sick? The world where we do not trust God or God's people to provide, so we result to grasping after the fruit of selfishness? The world where we point fingers and say, she made me do it, or he made me do it. The world where we have contempt for one another and for the rest of creation. Or is the world better when we trust God and God's creation? A world where we are not in competition for goods, but freely provide and care for one another. A world where we don't need to lie. Where we can comfortably take a day off. Where the most vulnerable are provided for. Where we don't need to murder, to ruin marriages, to steal, to lie in courts, to lustfully desire after what others have. We don't have to. We don't have to because we trust God and we trust God's creation to be on our side. This is a world where we don't point fingers because we have one another's back. 
There's no need to be selfish because we trust God and God's children to provide for one another. To recognize their shared humanity, shared createdness, their shared image of God that they possess. But yeah, this is a broken world. And we'll continue to mess up from time to time. But what we strive for is the ideal world where we live out perfectly the love for one another, the for-otherness. It's what Jesus calls the kingdom of God. It's what we read about in Revelation 21 when it says, look, God's dwelling is here among humankind. God will dwell with them, and they will dwell and be with God's people. God will be with them as their God. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. There will be no mourning, no crying or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. The former things have passed away. The world that we see illustrated in the myth of Genesis 3, it has passed away. If only we could trust God and God's creation and be all on the same page. And it is an ideal that we strive for. We may not ever see it in our lifetime, but that doesn't mean we don't look forward to it, that we don't shoot for that. It's the opposite of the myth in Genesis 3. That that is what we want. That is good news. And that is something that we can be part of creating here on earth. So may it be so. Dear God, may it be so. Among us now and forever. Amen.